The federal budget announced last week included money to help workers with new skills training. That will mean a major role for post-secondary institutions, which fall under provincial jurisdiction. Marilee Fullerton is Ontario's Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, the PC MPP for Canada Carleton, and she joins us now for more. So nice to have you in that chair. Thanks for having me. Your first time here. It is. I think I remember trying to book you numerous times when you were with the <laughs> Ontario Medical Association, and we never quite made it. But we got you here now. Very good. Let's just, to remind everybody, bring, uh, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring this chart up here with uh, the skills offerings in the last federal budget, which included training money, $250 a year, up to $5,000 for workers earning between ten dollars and $150,000. Paid EI leave, employment insurance leave, that's up to four weeks at 55% of salary via new EI training support benefit. There's the student work placement program, which would be an expanded work integrated learning situation. International Education Strategy, that's a work-study abroad pilot program. And Global Talent Stream is our fifth bullet point, that's connecting Canadian companies with skilled workers internationally. Can I just ask you generally off the top how those federal offerings compare to how you plan to tackle the skills mm -hmm. training situation in this province? Well, I can tell you that we recognize the urgent need to reform and transform and modernize uh, the skilled trades. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad to see that this is aligning with where we feel there needs to be interest and support. So you and the feds are on the same page on this? Well, let's just say I think that they're following us. So Well, okay. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, we, we don't have to get into that. But the, uh, um, let's put it this way. More than 50%, I think 56% of our population has some form of post-secondary education, mm -hmm. which is apparently great. That puts us number one in the OECD. The federal government, we have Nabdeem Baines in that chair last week, mm -hmm. uh, and he said the feds um, have a study out which say that there are 200,000 digitally skilled jobs that are expected to be needed in this province by 2021, in the country, I guess, and we can't fill them. Where are we going wrong? Well, we've heard all along uh, as a government that there's a skills gap, that employers are looking for workers with certain types of skills, and on the other side, uh, there's potential workers who are looking for the employers. So there is a skills gap, and we're looking at filling that skills gap, understanding the need uh, with the skilled trades to recognize that, and there's digital aspects to that as well. So part of the reforms that we're looking at is making it easier for apprentices uh, to match with the employers. And uh, there's a number of digital aspects that we're looking for in that as well. But there's global competition for workers. And this is increasingly a competitive, competitive environment uh, for talent. And uh, we're saying as a province that we need to up our game. We need to recognize that. And uh, this government is doing that. Up our game means what? Means looking at how we're going to train uh, people for not only the jobs of today, but also of the future. And it's the rapid pace of change that we need to be able to address, um, for not only from the skilled trades, but uh, there's disruptive technologies out there that are changing industries, entire industries. And look at the automotive industry. Uh, so we're looking at making sure there's things like micro-credentialing to make training more flexible and rapidly adaptable so that we can get workers, whether they need to be reskilled or upskilled, get them retrained, get them trained, and get them into the workforce because we want to make sure that our economy is thriving and uh, we need to make sure that we have the workforce for that. Does the post-secondary world in this province, all of our colleges and universities, in your view, do they need to work more closely with the private sector in order to ensure that there is a mm -hmm. greater match to what's coming out of those institutions and what's going into the workplace? That's a great point, and yes, I do. And I believe that it will be with these partnerships, the relationships, and the communication uh, to understand what is what can be developed within the post-secondary institutions and also to hear from the private sector what they're needing. And what we are hearing is, uh, again, there's a gap. Uh, some, uh, whether it's skilled trades or whether it's um, universities and colleges, that sometimes the workers get out there with their training, but they need to be upskilled uh, to get into the jobs that the employer needs them to be in. How much of the responsibility for doing that very thing uh, ought to be in the private sector itself as opposed to in the post-secondary world? Well, we need to understand what they, their needs are, and we've been listening to employers. 
uh, hearing what they need. And we're looking at making sure that there are the ability for us to match and talking to tradespeople, people in private businesses, uh, private uh, uh, groups, understanding what it is that they need us to do. And this is where we say, this is a digitalization world that we're in. Um, how do we accommodate that? At the same time, we see the skilled trades needing thousands of more uh, workers. And, uh, and how do we do that? So we've been working very, very quickly um, to make Ontario open for business. And I've heard that expression yes, before. Yes, few, maybe I'm a couple sure times. Have. I hope you have. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we just realized that uh, the, the jobs of today and tomorrow uh, we're looking at making sure that the credentialing, the micro-credentialing, for instance, for the automotive sector, the Driving Prosperity Plan, uh, is going to allow thousands of, of workers to be reskilled for new jobs and jobs that exist right now. I want to bring a chart up at this point, and this is something put up by McKinsey. Yes, you can uh, look at the monitor in here, and I'm going to describe this in some detail for people listening on podcast who can't see, we've got three pie charts here with the question, are Canada's youth adequately prepared for the workforce? And McKinsey and Company, the consulting companies, asked three different groups of people. They asked education providers, are Canada's youth adequately prepared for the workforce? And maybe not surprisingly, education providers by an 83% to 17% said yes, overwhelmingly. Then they asked youth, and youth said yes, but only by 44%, actually the majority, 56%, saying no, we're not ready. And then they asked employers, and employers said only a third, a little over, 34% uh, of uh, today's youth are adequately prepared for the workforce. Fully two-thirds of employers say it's not the case. We have quite a disconnect between what young people themselves and employers think about this question versus the people who are providing the education for those jobs of today and tomorrow. What do you make of that disconnect? Well, you know, I think if we look at post-secondary education or even, let's say, the apprentices, uh, apprenticeships, mm -hmm. the apprenticeship program is very complicated and not easy to use. And also we look at post-secondary institutions, colleges and universities where students may not understand what the job prospects are when they, when they choose their courses. So we need to do a better job of making sure that it's easier for students to understand the job outcomes and the job prospects for them when they go through their training. So that's a high school thing then you're saying, is that right? Well, it can go, especially for the trades, it can go back to high school. Uh, and this is something that we've been working with the Minister of Education on as well, mm -hmm. to make sure that the options are, are made available to students at that level. And take, for instance, the skilled trades, making sure that it's promoted so that students know that there's good paying jobs in the skilled trades, uh, but also that their job prospects uh, are good. Um, when, when we look at universities and colleges and we recognize that there are still areas, for instance, in STEM, where there's huge demand uh, for workers and we need to make sure students have that information when they're choosing uh, their courses. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem, I presume, here is parents who, they, you know, they all want Janie and Johnny to become doctors and lawyers and accountants and not necessarily electricians or welders or, or you know, plumbers who will make a great living in the future if they go into those trades, right? And I, I agree. In the past, there, there appears to have been a stigma attached to that. Mm -hmm. We need to do better. And we, we think even going back to elementary school to allow kids to have opportunities to understand what it means to, to be in a skilled trades and understand that there's tremendous and vibrant opportunities in the skilled trades. So it's, it's parents, it's teachers, it's guidance counselors, and, and we are uh, ramping up on a promotional campaign to get that message out. And uh, we're hoping to change that. Here's what Stephen Murphy, who's the president of the University of Ontario Institute of Technology in Oshawa, had to say. This was, uh, I guess, six months before GM made its announcement to close. So this goes back to the middle of last year. Massive disruption in the job market forces workers to constantly retool their skill sets to stay employable. This requires a flexible system of lifelong education. Yet the current system remains focused on people between the ages of 17 and 30. There is no reason learning has to take place within the conventional format of three-hour lectures and 13-week semesters. It can be adapted to focus on nine to five workers. Given the rapidly evolving advances in technology, universities and colleges have no choice but to reinvent themselves or risk becoming obsolete. You're the minister responsible for colleges and universities. What do you think about what he just said? Well, I think that's true. We're facing a very rapidly changing global um, situation in terms of competition, in terms of developments, whether it's technology or science. 
Uh, we need to keep up. And uh, that's exactly what we're doing in my ministry, is looking at ways we can uh, create more, uh, more of a dynamic interaction between colleges and universities, and even the trades, understanding that we can make sure that the, uh, that the oh, I say kids, but it's not kids always, it's, it's older people as well. Mm -hmm. How we make sure that our workforce is used to their full potential and that they can meet their full potential, and uh, that we can fill the jobs uh, of today and tomorrow and adapt to that using the flexibility of programs. And I'm a big believer that there's different training modalities that we can be using uh, and online programs, and, and that's happening already. Let's see whether or not the first big announcement that you made as a minister actually falls in line with what you just said. And to that end, we'll remind everybody, Sheldon, if you would, put this graphic up, of the announcement. I think this was your first big announcement out of the gate as the minister, uh, an announcement to lower tuition rates uh, by 10% for all domestic students in 2019-2020. Uh, freezing rates for the next year, allowing students to opt out of paying so-called ancillary fees. Uh, for grants, grant eligibility of family income is now going to be lowered to $140,000 annually. No more free tuition, so-called free tuition, as the previous government called it. Uh, and uh, no more six-month interest-free grace period for paying back your Ontario Student Assistance Plan, your OSIP, uh, OSAP rather, uh, loans. Uh, okay, there's lots of feedback to that. Here's how... Um, well, here's some of the feedback you got to that. Sheldon, the clip, please. The 10% tuition cut was a very pretty bow on a not-so-pretty package. In the end, I don't think it results in what students are thinking it might result in. The OSAP changes are obviously pretty devastating to each individual. Faculty are united with students across Ontario in opposition to, to these cuts. None of the stakeholders in our sector um, students, faculty, uh, at universities were consulted about these cuts. So that's obviously from a previous program we did on your announcement. I get, everybody gets, why a 10% cut in tuition fees would be something students would love and why it would be a political winner. How exactly does it help post-secondary institutions meet all of the disparate needs of their students uh, by depriving these post-secondary institutions of more revenue more than $400 million, I think, to do all these things. Well, the, first of all, it, all these the three elements needed to be taken as a package. Uh, the 10% uh, tuition reduction was really only, um, really equated to a 2 to 3% reduction in, in funding. It's 400 million bucks. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have to make sure that our OSAP system is sustainable. And according to the Auditor General's report in 2018, it was not on a sustainable trajectory. And so our, our focus was to make sure that, that people and families, students and families who really needed it, could get the funding to go to post-secondary education. And we looked at how best to do that, looking at the grants, and we actually increased the grants percentage from 76 to 82% for those families earning less than $50,000 a year, or students in the families earning less than $50,000 a year. So we're really looking at the overall package, but we also understand that we need innovation as well. You know, we need talent, we need innovation, and we need to be competitive. And, uh, you know, that's part of the driving prosperity plan as well. But these, these reforms that we did through the post-secondary education system were to make sure that post-secondary education stayed accessible and affordable, and that OSAP was sustainable for generations to come. I totally get that. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, families will love the news that their ch children's education is now more affordable and more accessible. I'm trying to figure out, though, how post-secondary institutions stay competitive, yes. stay relevant, mm -hmm. stay innovative, mm -hmm. all of which you want them to do, yes. while at the same time cutting their budgets by $440 million. Well, I, I would look at those institutions and say, I have confidence that they can innovate and find the savings. When we came to, uh, when we, we won the election uh, back in June, it was a mandate to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances. And uh, as a minister, my responsibility is to make sure that post-secondary education is affordable and accessible and that we offer quality education, high quality education. And uh, we're looking to do that with the changes that we're making. And uh, those really need to be taken as a package. The institutions have a number of 
of things that they can do, and I do have confidence that they can innovate. We have support from a number of the colleges uh, in, in this regard, and uh, we've been in regular communication with uh, the Sorry, leadership. You've, been, you've got support from the colleges to cut their budgets? Well, uh, suggesting that the reforms that we're making are, are uh, necessary and Including important. the tuition cuts, depriving them of revenue? Well, I, 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 won't, I don't have the quotes in front of me. I was but, just going to uh, say, I'd love to see them yeah, if you got yeah, them. No, I've, I read those out in, in the chamber in question period, so, so we can get them for you if, if you're interested. But just to say mm -hmm. that, that we are in communication and uh, it's very important for, for me as a minister to keep those lines of communication open uh, with our institutions to, to deliver high quality education, post-secondary education that is affordable. And uh, it was, we were not on a sustainable trajectory with the way OSAP was. And OSAP, as you know, is tied to tuition. Mm. Uh, I know combating sexual violence on campus has been a priority of yours. You made a big announcement about that not too long ago, maybe sometime in the last uh, week and a half or so. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let me follow up, though, with this statement released uh, the next day by uh, Canadian Federation of Students Ontario, quoting its national executive representative, Sammy Pritchard, who said, if Minister Fullerton was really committed to the safety of students, she would repeal the Student Choice Initiative that threatens all of these essential services that students' unions offer on a daily basis. That is a reference to your saying that all of the former ancillary fees which were mandatory, there, there's now going to be considerable choice in what students either do or do not have to pay. What was the value in doing that? Well, the student, we heard from students across Ontario about the cost of the fees that they were required to pay for programs or services that they didn't necessarily support. And the Student Choice Initiative was really two parts to that. One that would be essential, things like uh, mental health counseling, walk safe uh, programs, things that supported the students. So and those fees will persist? Those fees are considered essential. Uh, the institutions have the ability to determine what goes into those pools. And uh, for others, then, then we firmly believe that students are adults and they should be able to choose what they deem um, to be important for them and, and give them power in terms of their um, ability to determine how much they're paying f for this. It gives them more control and more power over the cost of their education. Who decides what an essential service on campus is? Well, ultimately, the institutions well, they are autonomous. Uh, universities are autonomous. Colleges, less so, but, but relatively. And uh, they will ultimately decide. But we have set some parameters. And uh, I think that you will, you will be pleasantly surprised, perhaps, um, that uh, we have very positive. I'm very proud of this, um, because I think it really is putting, um, giving students choice and allowing them to have, be empowered in the costs that they pay. Uh, for their education, no, they I get should it. be. Yeah, I, I get it. And uh, let me just—I mean—I'll pluck an example from my own uh, post-secondary experience uh, more than a hundred years ago. When uh, you know, I do recall going to U of T, and I do recall them saying, "You have a mandatory athletic center mm -hmm. fee that you've got to pay. We're trying to build a new athletic center, and here's the fee." And I remember thinking at the time, "There's a perfectly good athletic center at Hart House. There's another one somewhere else. Why are we paying this fee? We have to pay it." Well, as it turns out, there's a pretty fabulous world-class athletic center at U of T now. So, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it seemed a pretty good idea to pay it. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if that happened today, chances are I wouldn't pay it. Chances are U of T wouldn't have that facility. Would that well, be better for students as a whole? Well, I, I would just uh, stop you for a moment and ask you to consider that in our um, rollout, we included information that would suggest that that's not the case, that if there is a project that the institution has already embarked on, that that would have to continue, and that would be essential. Um, but it does give leeway to the institutions, and and there are uh, very generous donations being made to some of these uh, these institutions. I know I there was saw one the other day. My yes, God, hundred million, million bucks. dollars for you. Jerry Schwartz and Heather Reisman. Yes, yes. So for innovation. Mm -hmm. So I was pleased to hear that. Are you going to write that kind of check as well? <laughs> I didn't I mean wish. you personally. I meant your uh, government. Uh, well, uh, stay tuned. Well, stay tuned. <laughs> Okay, let's do, we got a couple of minutes left. Let me see if I can hit on a couple more things here. This post-secondary system that we have in this province is very dependent on attracting students from other countries overseas. And I think my numbers are right here. Apparently, international students contributed $6.3 billion to our economy. Um, that's important money, obviously. Do you, are you at all concerned that there is an over-reliance on international students in order to keep our 
post-secondary institutions going? Well, I think, uh, I think the international students um, play an important role uh, in our education system. I think there's exchanges that occur. They come here. They can see our culture. Our students can go uh, to other countries and see the cultures there. So I think there's tremendous value in that uh, for everyone. Um, but also how we look at um, perhaps um, outcomes. Uh, so in terms of our education and our post-secondary education programs, uh, I would like to see um, a more outcomes-based approach so that the institutions are not necessarily um, as, as uh, focused on enrollment, um, but international students have an important role to play uh, in this province. I wonder how concerned you are that many of them come here, get the education, and then leave. Uh, yes, they pay a premium in order to be educated here, but they tend not to stick around. The Munch School said 66% of recent software engineering grads from our top three schools are leaving to the United States. Mm. They're not all international students, obviously, but some of them are. How do we stop that brain drain? Well, I, if that's a, there is going to be global competition for a talent, and how we make our post-secondary education institutions attractive uh, to students from elsewhere is by making, keeping it affordable. Um, making sure that they have options to come and train here. And uh, I would say to anyone from any other country, we have a world-class education system here, and, uh, and uh, it should be considered. We want to thank Mary Lee Fullerton, the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, for spending some time with us on TVO tonight. We would uh, encourage you to tell your other Cabinet colleagues that uh, this is a place they may want to find some time on their itinerary for, Appreciate and we that. hope you'll accept our invitation to come back again in the exactly. future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.